Okay, uh, so we are live. Okay, great. Okay. So, Assalamu Alaikum and a very good evening to everyone. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe in your respective houses. I'm Narita Asim Parki, the Director of International Relations at the Community of Biotechnology and your host for today's session. Community of Biotechnology is a non-profit organization based in Bangladesh, providing numerous opportunities to students from all aspects of biological sciences around the world to participate and engage in multiple activities. We have organized two international events this year alongside several webinars. However, our session for today is quite unique and about a topic that plays a major role in scientific fields but is often less discussed or known. Our session for today is titled Genomic Health Disparities and it will be conducted by none other than Dr. Nazneen Aziz. Dr. Nazneen Aziz is the president and CEO of Varian Genomics. Varian Genomics provides expert advice and guidance for implementing clinical genomic testing and precision medicine approaches in community healthcare systems in the US, as well as in developing nations. She is the former executive director of the Kaiser Permanent Research Bank and the senior vice president and chief research officer at Phoenix Children's Hospital, as well as the director of molecular medicine at the College of American Pathologists. In her industry career, Dr. Aziz focused on personalized medicine biomarkers, genetic tests, and development of drugs for cancer and diabetes. And prior to her joining her biotechnology industry, Dr. Aziz was an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital, where she discovered new genes and their role in polycystic kidney disease. Additionally, Dr. Aziz was named by the Arizona Republic as one of the 15 people worth watching in 2015 and by the Arizona Business Magazine as 2014 Most Influential Women in Arizona Business. Dr. Aziz also holds an adjunct professorship in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University and was formerly an adjunct professor in the Department of Child Health at Arizona College of Medicine. She is further involved with several other organizations and has contributed as well to in, uh, in leadership positions in many more. However, I would like to stop here to give her the floor for her talk. But before I do so, I would like to take the time to thank her for joining us today despite having such a busy schedule and within such a short time span. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, you may continue the session. Okay, great. All right. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining. It's late at night in Dhaka. And uh, so um, I commend you for staying up to listen to a scientific talk. And I hope you will get something out of this. It's an important topic, as Nairita mentioned. And I would like to um, thank Nairita and the community of biotechnology for inviting me to speak. I think it's a good opportunity to learn and you guys are doing great things for the country and for South Asia. Um, so I have changed the topic slightly, Narita, you will see, because I think it's a topic I need to introduce more slowly, but towards the end of the talk, you will see that I'm talking about the importance uh, of an awareness of genomic health disparities. But initially, I'll just talk about what is precision medicine and how it helps, um, you know, guide health and so on and, the, and its importance. So I'll get started now. I have about 30 slides, so I think I want to end by 30 minutes. That gives you an opportunity to ask as many questions as you want. And I think that will be more productive for the audience. All right, so let's get started. I'm going to pull up my slides now, and you tell me, Narita, if you can't see it, okay? Okay, let's see. Can you see it, Narita? 
Uh, not yet, I think. Yes, I oh, think. Oh, it's, it's, there is a little bit of a lag. Okay. All yes. right. So I hope everyone can see the screen. And as you see, the title is a little different. I, I wanted to begin by mentioning how precision medicine is helping patient care and population health. And then we'll go into the genomic health disparities. So I think this audience is aware that a DNA sequencing technology called next generation sequencing came into being. And I want to outline its importance in driving precision medicine. So you all know the Human Genome Project, which um, uh, was a multinational, um, US and UK, and I think even Japan might have been involved in uh, sequencing the first human uh, DNA. Um, so that took about 13 years from 1990 to 2003 and it cost a lot. It was called the Human Genome Project and it took 13 years and it cost about 3 billion. And we have learned a lot from that. Knowing the first human sequence, that there has been a lot of research application to that knowledge. But now we are in the era of genomic medicine where individual patients are being sequenced and their clinical report is letting us know uh, what disease they might have, being able to predict and so on. So a little bit about next generation sequencing without getting too much into the details. It's also called massively parallel sequencing in that the Sanger sequencing, which was used to do the human genome sequence, that was a very slow and laborious process because you took each piece of DNA sequence, so this is a piece show, showing up as a spot over here, and you put it through a capillary sequencing gel. So that took a long time and it was very costly. But over here, you can see on the left-hand side, these little dots, colorful dots, show that these all are being sequenced, these pieces of DNA, all at the same time. That's why it's also called massively parallel sequencing. And then out of this sequencing, you get a jumble of raw sequence data. And these are these, and in, it's in no order. And so those are called the fast Q files. And then the fast Q files are processed bioinformatically. And then they align to this reference sequence at the very top. So on the right hand side of the panel, you can see the reference sequence and these little pieces of sequences are being placed and aligned to that reference sequence. Narita, quick check. Everything is okay? You can hear me? I hear you. And everything's fine. Okay, great. Um, then in this slide, I show that next generation sequencing gives you not only qualitative information, whether a patient has a G instead of a a. So in the human reference sequence, you'll see in this part, there is a G, but this patient has an A. So that's a qualitative information we are getting. But if this patient was heterozygote, meaning it inherited G from one parent and A from another parent, we would get over here 50% Gs and 50% A. But in this case, the person is homozygous. So you also get qu quantitative information. And this depth of coverage, how many times this patient is read by these sequence read is also very important because then you get the confidence that this is indeed the correct sequence. So uh, this is just a slide to show that the cost per human genome has come down dramatically from 2001. Here it's 100 a million, um, yes, a hundred million that to cost, uh, to sequence an individual human being, um, whole genome. So because it was done with the Sanger sequence. And then in next generation sequencing came up in 2005. And then when it was applied to human genome sequencing, the cost went down dramatically, as you can, I hope you can see my cursor. So now around 2020, it costs less than 
uh, a thousand. It's around eight hundred eight hundred dollars. So it's dramatic, and this is the line that shows Moore's law, meaning any new technology cost, like a new television, will cost. Um, you know, two years later, the price will go down, and so this technology has really beat even the Moore's law, where it doesn't follow a linear line, but it dropped sharply as soon as next generation sequencing was applied. And over here, it shows you the cost per raw megabase of DNA sequence. So um, this is not a whole genome, but you know, just shows you how much would it cost to sequence one million basis of DNA. And again, it just shows the data in a different way. And so over here by 2020, you can see that to sequence 1 million bases of DNA would be less than a cent. And so over here, I'm going to take you back. Since you can't see it too well, we'll look at only data from 2017 to 2020 in this Excel file. Over here, you can see that um, to sequence 1 million bases, it cost only about $0.008. So this is less than a cent. And the cost per human genome is, I was wrong, not 800, about 700. So this has dramatically um, increased our opportunity and it made it feasible that we can now sequence human beings in the clinic. Um, we don't need to sequence a whole person, but we can sequence large parts of the um, you know, patient's DNA. And this just slide talks about the phases in the adoption of a new genetic test. So in the early development, when someone discovers that this is a good marker, let's say for breast cancer, and then the, after about five years, it becomes available for clinical use. And then Medicaid and other insurance providers and professional societies like CAP and so on, the College of American Pathologists might say that, yes, this test should be done in uh, routinely. So that takes another five years. And by the time the test becomes clinically mature, meaning it's routinely being done, just like blood sugar and, and so on, then it's about 15 years or so. That's the usual time for the adoption of any new genetic test. But in this case, NGS publication was in 2005, and by 2010, it was being clinically used. So this was dramatic because it's five years' time, and it's been clinically applied instead of 15 years for the test to mature. But this is also very interesting because NGS is a highly complex test. It is not a, by any means an easy test because it's high data volume and it's very complicated. So it's very amazing that the clinical community, the labs that send out diagnostic tests to patients um, or, or to their doctors, started implementing NGS so quickly. Um, it's because of its, you know, great potential. But so the clinical utility, you could look at targeted panels. So you could take about 400 genes or 500 genes for cancer and instead of the whole genome that you can do, and it would have high depth of coverage. And I'd shown you what the depth of coverage means when I showed you a picture of NGS. And this works really well in the clinic. Now, exome is a little bit more expensive, but it allows you to do 92% coverage of all of the coding region of the genomes. That means all of the parts of the genome that code for genes and not the intragenic regions and so on. And so it's also very cost effective. And then whole genome would sequence the patient from end to end. And this would be very expensive and um, there would be complications of this large volume of data and what to do with it because we don't need to do the whole genome. So for clinical use, you really don't need to sequence uh, the whole genome. And then all of these companies, and I'm showing over here Illumina, that um, they 
came up with different sequencing machines, and this doesn't even cover many more that has come up after that. So MySeq, NextSeq, HiSeq, and um, HiSeq X10, these have different power, and these cost about two million or more. Um, and you really don't need it because that is when you're sequencing a whole genome. But for a clinical testing lab, you could all you need is a MySeq, NextSeq, or NovoSeq that I'm not showing over here. So, and it's not just Illumina, many other companies, Thermo Fisher, um, and so on, are coming up with their own sequencing machines. And so, what has uh, done to this area of clinical genomics is that more and more people are getting sequenced as because the cost is dropping. So first it was Craig Venter, who was a part of the Human Genome Project. He uh, set up his own institution and sequenced his own genome. Then Jim Watson, the father of you know the double helix. And so more and more people started getting sequenced. And so now this blue line, this blue arrow indicates that many, many genomes are known now in the uh, world databases. There's not just one, but many different databases, but the number of people who have been sequenced um, is huge. So now we understand a lot more about what leads to disease and health. And this just shows you the number of new genetic tests from 2014 to 2017 that uh, around 2014, the number of tests was somewhere in around 500 or maybe 700. And then right now, and it doesn't even cover 2020, um, it's up to 14,000 new genetic tests. And there are 10,000 unique tests and 10 new genetic tests are coming in the market almost daily. So that just shows you how quickly this field is expanding. Um, and over here, they took all of the genetic tests that are, have been ordered from 2014 to 2016 in the US, and what proportion of these are different tests. So prenatal tests are the non-invasive um, testing of pregnant women's blood for fetal DNA to look at any kind of defect that the child might have, chromosomal defect and so on. And then these are inherited cancer tests like BRCA and Lynch syndrome and so on. And then other tests are lower. And oncology also is very important in cancer to do this kind of genetic test. And then, but if you look at it in another way, these multi Multiple gene, I showed you gene panels. So this multiple gene tests are more common than exome or this WES is exome and WGA is whole genome. So you really don't need it for clinical use. And single gene tests are going down. As you can see, it's downward slope. People are stopping uh, carrying on a single gene test because it's more expensive to do it than to do multiple gene tests. So the different uh, gene panels that are used in different clinics, and this is outdated. There are many more genes and many more panels. This is autism, cardiomyopathies, ciliopathies, epilepsy, eye disorder, and so on. And so there are many, many genes that are being added to these panels, and these are being conducted in uh, clinical labs. <clears throat> Before I get more into it, I want to talk about the sequencing steps, there are three distinct steps. One is the wet branch process, meaning you take the patient sample, you purify the DNA, you break it up, and then you put it in the machine and it's pretty much automated. So this thing is not very hard to do in countries like um, in developing world and in Bangladesh and so on, because all you need is to train the med medical technologist, buy the machine, and run a lab. This is the part that gets a little bit difficult for developing nations where uh, bioinformatics processing, alignment, variant calling, and variant annotation uh, comes into play. Like, well, how do you process the DNA? It's the data and, and analysis that's important. And then comes, you perhaps can't see this, 
it's clinical interpretation. And now that is also a very difficult step. And so these are places where I think um, nations like Bangladesh and other nations in South Asia and Africa may have issues because maybe we do not have the clinical uh, workforce that have the expertise to do these. So variant interpretation, the last step, I'll talk a little bit about it. So if you sequence someone's whole genome, I'm considering the whole genome, there, there'll be about 3.5 to 4.5 million variants. And what I mean by variants, as you know, is the place where the patient is different from the reference sequence. Now, that doesn't mean that the reference sequence is the right sequence. It just means it's a difference. And that's why it's called a variant. We don't call mutations anymore because mutations have a negative connotation that it, it causes uh, disease. But so that, therefore, the terminology variants are being used. And um, then so some of these variants may be completely benign and it might even protect the person against diseases and some are likely benign some are variants of unknown significance it looks kind of pathogenic but we're not quite sure and then this is very likely pathogenic and pathogenic this was a guideline that i was a co-author of along with uh, when i was at cap along with acmg and amp association of molecular pathologist and American College of Medical Geneticists and CAP came up with this guideline. And this is highly cited. It's like it has over 12,000 citations today or more. And the reason is that people just didn't know what to do with all this variance when you sequence a patient. And that gives you some kind of guidance as to how you filter and categorize that into these five different um, buckets. But these are mainly for Mendelian disease and not for complex diseases. And I will talk about that a little later. So what do you do with these markers or variants? It can be used in two different buckets. First is preventive medicine. If you knew that this is an early this is a marker of disease, then you can sequence somebody at 20 years or even in the childhood and say that this person may likely get hypertension and you can then put them on a regimen that will prevent that hypertension. As you know, it's always easier to prevent than to manage the disease. And then the other markers are diagnostic markers. So if somebody has a cancer, you can sequence and tell what is the gene that is causing that cancer. So that's a diagnostic cancer. Or what is the disease? Is it Huntington's? And so that is in the area of therapeutic intervention is by you do, uh, you know, diagnostic test for Mendelian diseases or for cancer. And then also this area of disease monitoring is becoming very important. Um, it's called pharmacogenetics, where you can look at a marker to see if a drug really is working, or you can look at markers that may cause toxicity of the drug to the patient. And that's how you can then give the right drug to the right patient. So as you see from healthy state, we go into disease state. And then in the course of managing the disease, we might get other complications due to drug. And that but all of these markers can be utilized. And that's why the importance of genetics besides other testing, right? Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the concept of monogenic diseases versus complex diseases. Monogenic diseases are diseases like cystic fibrosis, like polycystic kidney disease, like uh, beta thalassemia, and Huntington's disease, where a single gene, if you have the defect, like it shows over here in red, then you would get the disease. And there's not, not much that you can do to avoid getting the disease. All you can do is manage the disease. So it is very much deterministic. Then over here on the right hand side is common, complex, multigenic, non Mendelian diseases. So these are diseases like hypertension, type 2 diabetes autoimmune disease, autism. It's not a single gene, but multiple genes that have a cumulative effect. So if you inherit multiple 
genes that have small effects, it doesn't have a strong effect, then you, you could be likely that you would get, let's say, hypertension. Now, some of these genes may be protective and that might protect you from hypertension. So that is a very difficult area and people are making strides in this area, but it's still, uh, we need to know a lot more. But this area of monogenic diseases is well understood because these are mostly in the coding region and these variants are mostly in non-coding region, meaning they regulate the expression of the gene, but doesn't change the amino acid or the structure of the gene. So these are deterministic and this is probabilistic. That means it doesn't really mean that if you have uh, these genes that you would get it. It is if you have a healthy lifestyle, then you might avoid getting the disease. So it's more um, a matter of statistics and probabilistics rather than deterministic. So that's how I want to sort of categorize the two different disease groups. So essentially, you might have seen this slide, like this was the promise of personalized medicine, and that was hyped up right after the human genome was sequenced, that patients can now be categorized into um, different groups, drugs that work for them, and would be beneficial drugs that don't work for them. So you could separate out the yellow from the green and the red and so on. But that really, that promise didn't pan out because we were still using Sanger sequencing. It was not possible to sequence so many patients. But right now, with next generation sequencing, you really can deliver the promise of precision medicine and you can really uh, deliver the right drug to the right person at the right dosage, um, and, and use it for precision diagnos, uh, diagnosis. So that is where um, we are all very excited about that. And I'm going to briefly talk about opportunities in um, cancer treatment and management with next generation sequencing. So cancer is a disease that happens due to many different genes that start uh, the cell to aberrantly um, proliferate or divide when it's not supposed to. And that is not due to one gene. So these are called oncogenes or tumor suppression genes. With next generation sequencing, you can very accurately diagnose what is the gene that is being mute, has been mutated and causing the cell to grow abnormally. And so it allows subtyping of cancer. So if you look at breast cancer under the microscope, they'll all look the same. But if you do the next generation sequencing or other molecular profiling, you will be able to say this, is, this breast cancer is due to BRCA, and not due to estrogen receptor and so on. And therefore, targeted therapies could be given to patients that have different types of cancer by the molecular analysis. And so it, you have obviously better patient options and preference, and you don't have to give them all chemo, which can cause some difficulties. So this just shows you breast cancer from five different women. And if you look at the circus plot, which is another way of showing the genomic mutations in these patients, and I'm calling it mutation because these are actually causing, you know, the pathogenesis, the uh, aberrant proliferation of the cells, that they look very different, although they're all breast cancer under the microscope. And so is it right to give them all the same drug when they're having the breast cancer due to different mutations. So that is the power of being able to sequence patients' DNA from this cancer tissue and being able to then give the right drug. Because you could have breast cancer due to um, an inherited gene called BRCA1 or BRCA2 uh, or BRCA1 and 2 or estrogen receptor HER2. So there are you know, multiple genes that are known to cause cancer and you need to actually profile a patient's cancer. So now I'm gonna change a little bit of direction and talk about the power of biobanks where you collect patients' genomic data, but when you sequence them, but also the phenotypic 
data, meaning what kind of cancer did they have or what kind of polycystic kidney did they have and, and so on. And this is really important for understanding what to do with future patients. So in this is a concept of biobank. So the patient comes in, they give the DNA and this DNA is sent to the DNA sequencing lab, it's sequenced and then with informed consent, it's transferred into a database where the patient's DNA is. Then the patient also gives consent for their health records, meaning, yes, I have blood pressure and I have cancer or whatever, you know, all of this metrics from the doctor's visit goes into the same database. So this is phenotypic data and this is genotypic data. And with this database where you have clinical data and also DNA sequence data, you can do a lot of population health research as the number of patients grows. So this is just showing one patient. Now imagine if you would have a million patients giving that this database has their sequence and their health record, you could do powerful population-based research to know what are the genetic variants or mutations that are causing different types of disease that look the same, right? So hypertension could be due to different genes, type two diabetes could be due to different genes and so on. So one of the important is the largeness of size, like you need large sample size and you need to have very good electronic medical records and you need to have participant ethnicity, meaning you just can't st study one population. One population might be important for that population only, but it's not transferable. So with a European Caucasian ethnicity, what we know about their health and disease is not the same as what it would mean for a South Asian ethnic group, right? For Bangladeshis, or Japanese or Chinese, it would be different. And so there's a lot of areas of opportunity for research in population health from this diverse ethnic group. And this will obviously, these sort of databases will enable research and improve our understanding of the genetic and environmental factors that are involved in complex diseases. And in, in, let's say I'll talk about Bangladeshi population, right? So this is now bringing me to the actual topic that I want to talk about, the value of minority ethnic group for population databases. Why we should be looking at this bias that we are now creating in an, inadvertently with the power of this technology. Because this power of this technology has enabled us to learn a lot about the European ancestry. So if you look at this, in 2009, these were GWAS studies, obviously not sequencing, but you know, still genetic studies. And there were 373 studies and it included 1.7 million people sample. But most of them were of European ancestry. So we have learned so much, right? And only 4% was of non-European ancestry. And then in 2016, seven years later, we have had many more studies, right? 35 million samples, 2,500 studies. And again, 81% are European, but now this time, this is good news, we have more um, non-European ancestry, about 20% or so. And so this is very good news, but it's still not good enough because we simply need, um, don't know enough about this other non European ancestry. Now, if you break down that 3% and that 14% of um, minority population, again, most of it is Asian ancestry. That doesn't mean it's South Asian. These are mostly what's happening in China and Korea and Japan. So, so this represents a larger portion and then very little Blacks, um, African ancestry and Hispanic and so on. And, and, you know, South Asia is not even mentioned because that's a different ethnic group. And then with the increase to 20%, again, 15% of it is Asian population. So essentially, I think what I'm trying to say is that there is a large gap and a large disparity that's happening in genomics because we simply are not studying enough 
of the minority-ish ethnic group. Now, obviously, that's not a minority in Bangladesh and India and Pakistan, but it's a minority over here. But if we don't know about these ethnic groups, we are creating this large health disparity. So over here is... Um, you may know that there is a big um, database called the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA. And if you look at the total number of prostate cancer, 495 samples, out of that, 83% is white, 12% is black, 2% is Asian, American Indians is zero, Native Hawaiian is zero. And, and so on, if you go through and look at all of the different cancers, breast cancer, lung cancer, and so on. So what ultimately it's causing is that we know very little about these sort of populations and what causes their cancer. So the key point of this JAMA study was that this is this uh, Journal of American Medical Association study that did this, uh, the cancer genome atlas study. So what's the racial distribution? They found that it's a very much a big disparity in the number of patient samples that we have. So from 5,729 samples showed that only 12% were Blacks, 3% were Asian, and for no racial minority could we detect a mutational frequency of 5% in any cancer type analyze. So meaning that there are insufficient samples from racial minorities to detect even moderately common genomic alterations in this population. So let's say I'll take Bangladeshi population. Maybe there's a particular mutation that happens in let's say liver cancers in Bangladeshis. That may not be the same as a liver cancer in a Chinese population or a European population. So we need to uh, be aware that it's not transferable. So this, I largely, I want to end by talking about a study that I'm doing. It's still ongoing with Dr. Asmeri Sultana, Dr. Richard Mallow, and Dr. Sabrina Elias in Dhaka, who is really doing this very exciting project where we are uh, serving Bangladeshi physicians, and we have about 167 responses, and it's sent to all kinds of physicians. And we just wanted to get their attitude and their awareness of this field. And it's very interesting, the responses that we are getting and their enthusiasm to learn about this field. But right now, we asked a question, what is the frequency of genetic DNA tests you order for your patients as compared to other tests like imaging, blood chemistry, immunohistochemistry. And in red, you see very rarely 76%. And this is a minor portion saying always, oh, this, this is good. Maybe these are doctors who are more aware of it. And, um, you know, uh, and uh, that's always and frequently, but never. And 76% very rarely is concerning to us. So with that, I think I will just talk about what could we do about uh, this increasing genomic health disparities in non-European ancestry. We can definitely increase genomic testing capabilities in South Asia because um, even though there are some labs that are trying to do that, um, they're not fully equipped with bioinformatics. It's even though they might buy a kit <clears throat> that might have all the software, as a package, but still it needs to be tweaked and they don't. So I think there is a large gap in the health technology workforce in, in having people who know data science, who know bioinformatics, and there are not enough graduate and undergraduate programs within the public and private universities in South Asia to be creating the workforce. And we obviously not only have to increase genomic testing, but increase database of genomic sequences for South Asian population um, so that we understand and interpret their genomic tests better than looking at and comparing it with the European ancestry population. So that is it. You know, that's the end of my talk. And I'd be happy to 
get your reaction and get um, your um, you know questions. So um, let's see, Nairita, are you there? Okay, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for such an informative session. So during our session, our audience left us few questions. Um, the questions will be appearing on your screen. I'll read them out for you, if that's okay. Okay. Yes. So first one's from uh, Muhammad Ashikur Rahman. That's a, uh, from just, uh, it's a really big, Big pleasure to have you here. Oh, thank and you. <laughs> one from Zeva, ma'am. Okay, good. Hi, Zeva. And thank you for your kind welcome. I'm happy to be here. Okay, so the next one's from Shagorika. Which one does a scientist prefer more, solid sequencing or Illumina sequencing? Um, to be honest, I think that. Um, Illumina sequencing has more preferred for research and for um, for clinical use. And solid sequencing has some value, but it's not as um, it's not as cost effective. So Illumina sequencing, I would say, has taken over. But there are other companies like Iron Torrent, which is bought by Thermo Fisher, that is also doing. Um, sequencing that is not as costly. But Sonnet did play a role early on in the field. I hope that helps. Okay, so the next one's from Tanvir Ahmed Miloy. To do an infectious viral whole genome like SARS CoV 2 using NGS platform, what minimum biosafety level scientists must maintain? Again, you know, this is a, I would say that it would be once you've uh, extracted the DNA, you're bringing a very highly infectious um, agent, a virus into the lab. It has to be almost BL4, I would think, because, um, you know, it could lead to a lab accident. Like, you know, uh, it could expose the scientists to the virus as you're trying to extract the DNA. Um, for sequencing it using any pl platform, but the fact that you're handling a highly infectious virus and you know the havoc that it's causing in the world with the pandemic, it's because it's so highly infectious and it can also go into the trash and that will uh, spread rapidly in the community. So I would say that it would be um, BL4 lab, biosafety level four. Okay, the next one is again from Shagorika. What is the most potential difference between predictive biomarkers or prognostic biomarkers? So, um, so predictive biomarkers would be, let's say a person doesn't have the disease. So you're looking at a 20 year old healthy man and you've sequenced his genome and you look at markers that we know that people who have these genetic variants get hypertension. So you can almost predict at that age when he is completely healthy, doesn't have hypertension or doesn't have type two, that because you have it, you're very likely to get it by the time the disease manifests, that's about 40 or so, that you might get the disease. So that's predictive. So you can almost predict that the person will get it. And prognostic biomarkers are let's say a person has um, certain markers that give them type 2 diabetes but they always you can almost looking at the markers you can say that person's diabetes is not going to be a rapid trajectory it'll go slow so you can almost um, predict the trajectory of the disease. So that's a very slight difference. One is when you don't have the disease and you can predict that they'll get it. And the other is when the person has the disease, what kind of 
disease severity the person will get? Is it mild disease or will it be very serious disease? So you can almost do prognosis. So that'll help a physician understand how to manage the patient. For example, if in COVID we knew, like it's such a strange infectious disease, some people are getting away with very mild disease. They hardly, you know, they're asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. And, but others are dying, right? They're getting into the ICUs. If we knew, if there was a certain marker within the host, meaning not the virus sequence, that tells us why this person is reacting so severely, that's a prognostic biomarker. So um, that, that's another example of knowing how to treat the disease. Again, from Tanbir, how much time does it take to do a whole genome sequencing of a patient using NGIS platform? So whole genome sequencing, as you know, is uh, about 6 billion bases or 3 billion base pairs. And that's a lot of data. And usually it takes about two weeks. Um, I mean, you can also rush it in one week. Um, using NGS. But for clinical use, you don't need whole genome sequencing. You can do a gene panel or the exomes, and that should be good enough. But a whole genome would take a good, I would say, two weeks from time of getting the DNA from the patient by the time you have created a report, meaning analyzed and clinically interpreted the sequence. So a question from Tanzina Tuli. Will the lack of advanced technology in developing country create discrimination in health supports in the future when compared to developed countries? Yes, absolutely. And that's the focus of my talk and many of the work that I'm doing. I'm sort of worried about this lack of advanced technology for healthcare in developing country. So it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have it. I mean, this technology is doing such great things in the Western world, in US and UK and Japan and so on. But it is also leading to a widening of the gap because I think that this advanced technology is not being adopted as quickly in the developing nations. And that is worrisome because then we, even if we know how to do it, we'll be far behind in our understanding of the variants because we don't have enough people sequenced. Like the database doesn't have enough Bengalis or Indians or Pakistanis or Nepalis to be sequenced so that we know what are the different genetic variants that causes their disease. So that is inadvertently leading to this disparity. I wouldn't say discrimination, but it's more leading to a disparity of uh, this advanced health technology uh, compared to developed nations and developing nations. Because I, in my sort of experience in understanding what Bangladesh has, it and, and you can see from the doctor's survey that it's not being used. Even the single gene tests and even molecular genotyping is not being used very commonly. A question from Maisha Farzana. Isn't there a factor of moral ambiguity when it comes to keeping records of risk factors of individuals in databases? No, that's a very good question. It's not just moral ambiguity it it needs to be a law and in america and many other european nations there is a law that was enacted in 2008 called gina that means genetic information non-discrimination act that means you cannot if the patient's data somehow leaks out an employer cannot not hire that person. So it's, it's against employment discrimination and against 
health insurance discrimination. So you have to be very careful and have um, strong privacy in when you have these databases uh, because you know it can always be used in a negative way and therefore it's very important to have these kind of very strong uh, security and there there are HIPAA compliant databases that Amazon and many other uh, big data companies have they do have this it's called HIPAA, it's like a privacy, that they show that they have all the audits to make sure that the data cannot be breached. So it's a very good question, but um, I think that that shouldn't mean that we shouldn't do it, because if you have the right HIPAA compliant databases and uh, the right training, that this can be kept quite secure. And over here, as you know, it's it's highly secure. There's been many, many labs all over the nation that's sequencing patient and they're kept under strict control and we have not had any such leaks or uh, such risks. How will pharmaceutical industries respond to develop precision medicine for very rare genetic diseases? Yeah, that's a very good question. So pharmaceutical industries tend to do um, what is called blockbuster drugs, right? They want to um, do drugs that will sell to a larger market. And so if you have a very rare genetic disease where it's only like 0.001 or 0.001% of the world's population, they don't want to get into these areas. And at least over here in the US, the FDA supports what's called an orphan drug. That means if it's a very rare disease and pharma companies don't want to get it, they make it very beneficial for the pharma companies by giving them expedited review, reducing the taxation. So they want to encourage these pharma companies to go into these areas of what's called orphan drug. So essentially also there are orphan rare disease associations and patient advocacy group that are working with these pharma companies. So there are ways by which that you can mitigate that risk of pharma companies only wanting to go after hypertension, or type two, because these happen a lot, right? There's like 50% of people over the age of 50 will have one of these common diseases, but these rare genetic diseases, it is true that some companies may say that that's not for us because it's not gonna make us a lot of money, but then there are a lot of small biotech companies are saying that's exactly where we want to go because we will get the benefits from the FDA. Oh, that's interesting. So that COB is Community of Biotechnology. Is that right? Yeah, I would love yes. to help you guys. I think you guys are doing great things for you know the students and the graduate students and even the professors to bring in um, speakers from elsewhere so you get fresh perspective. Yeah, I would be delighted. Since human experience uh, multiple mutations every day through most of the nine, how can we cope up with the record of one's genome information? So, you know, we have systems within our bodies that take care of these mutations. So uh, during the division of a cell as the DNA is being replicated, if a mutation happens, and it's benign or even pathogenic, they, we have what is called um, DNA enzymes that will repair it. 
And so you don't get any big disease. And so you, when you sequence them, actually there is no change from the time a child is born to a child, you know, when in, even in old age, if you compare the two sequences, they're not too different. That's why DNA is static. Um, because we have this DNA repair enzymes that are constantly changing it. So we don't have to worry about, and especially if it's benign changes that happen, it's not causing any disease. So you don't have to worry about um, the information um, record being changed. So once you sequence a DNA, that should be pretty much the same. But in cancer, it's different. So if you get a cancer and then you're treated and then Five years later, you get the cancer recur. You may have to sequence that, you know, piece of tissue that that would be not the blood, but the tissue, and you might see different um, mutations that the the cancer now bypassed the drug and was able to escape the uh, anti-cancer drugs and cause the you know cancer to regrow. So that's a different kind of so in cancer pathology, you would need to sequence again and again. But that happens every five, 10 years with the new drugs that are very nicely managing cancer. But for um, the germline DNA, it doesn't change much. And we don't need to worry about the benign changes that happens because if it's not causing disease then you don't really need to know about that. Oh, it's, you know, this is a very good question. What is the public opinion about the acceptance of precision medicine? Um, so by precision medicine, don't think of it as a medicine. It's more the practice of medicine, like how physicians are practicing medicine now differently. Before they would look at the symptom and say, oh, you have th this cancer, and they would give the same drug, chemo, and that might do more harm. But now it's like you can do more precise diagnostics. And so you precisely know what drugs to give them. So it's been very well accepted. And in fact, I think it was in uh, President Obama's um, era that he created a huge sort of um, precision medicine um, program called All of Us, where they're sequencing, I think they want to sequence about a million people and so it's been very well accepted at all levels, at the level of the government, at the level of the clinics and hospitals, and even public health, um, you know, saying, why don't we try to avoid cancers that might kill, right, like breast cancers or Lynch syndrome? Like if it's inherited, then why don't we try to make people aware of these cancers before they get it, right? So that they can manage it and go and have more screenings and more early surgeries and so on. So there, there has been a great acceptance of precision medicine, meaning not just medicine, but the practice of medicine by using this precise diagnostics and precise um, management tools, even if it's a drug or surgery and so on. So I, in my company, we are doing consulting. So I get a lot of other experts into my projects to help different healthcare systems do that. But if there is in, an opportunity that a project is getting too large and we need student help, obviously I would consider that. But at the moment, because of COVID, things are different. You know, it's like I'm just using other expert consultants and myself, uh, myself to do big projects. But thank you for your interest. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope this was helpful, and I'm happy to take more questions. If we make the access of the patient's uh, genome sequence, free um, of the doctors, doesn't that make the information kind of free for all? 
what's your thought of the necessity to protect this information from the public? And so uh, let me try to understand if I got the question right. So you're saying that uh, if we make the patient's genome sequence uh, with no doctor's intervention, and that's already happening in the United States. It's called direct-to-consumer genetic testing, right? So there are many companies that are giving out to patients their health information based on their gene sequence or genotyping, like 23andMe and Helix and Color, that are not going through a prescribed doctor's prescription. They are sending, they're creating a portal, patient then logs in and sees, oh, I have, you know, uh, the risk for this disease and so on. Now, there has been some controversy with the FDA over here that did not like it, but FDA has now is working with these companies that you cannot give out risk factors for very serious diseases, but you can give out fun genetics information, like your risk for baldness, or your risk for being a good athlete. Are you a sprinter or are you a long distance runner? So there are many of these companies, like what kind of wine do you like? So there are many of these uh, direct to consumer that companies that have popped up and many, many, and they are giving out information to the patient and people believe, why not? It's your own DNA and I have a right to know. And it, it talks about ancestry, like where do I come from? Where did my, in, um, you know, where's my heritage from? So this should be obviously free. Now there is some risk that this should not, they should not be selling information about cardiovascular risk or cancer without a doctor's intervention. And so, um, for example, if you want to go and get your 23andMe and get some fun genetic information about your ancestry or ancestry.com is another company, then why not? Does a doctor have to uh, regulate that? And it doesn't mean that you make it public. You could keep it very private because it's yours. So I hope, I hope that answered your question. If not, I'm happy to take a follow up on this. Do we need to select specific model organisms for in vitro tests for precision medicines and drugs that are tailored to a specific group of people? Um, so, you know, when we do testing in the pharmaceutical companies for uh, drugs before it goes into people, they do a lot of what is called pre-IND studies, meaning making sure that it's not causing toxicity and they use rabbits and so on. So those are causing general toxicity, right? But if it's efficacious, meaning if that particular drug only works for a subset of people, that is being done at, in the level of the clinical trial. So it's now past all the tests that it's not causing toxicity or liver failure, and so those are in vitro tests that you need to do even before you get into a human being, right? So phase one is when you first do the testing in humans. And then phase two is larger groups of people. And phase three is even larger when you're looking at the dosage and efficacy and any side effects. So those are actually trial is research, right? So and people sign up for it because they are willing to take the risk. But even before you get to humans, you have to do a set of experiments that are in vitro. That means in cell culture or not, and you can do it in vivo, meaning you can do it in rabbits and guinea pigs and so on to make sure that that's not killing them, that it doesn't cause liver failure and so on. So for precision medicine, for drugs to work for a certain group of people is only the efficacy markers. So it's not causing any large damage. But in the clinical trials, you can also see if it's causing some harm to people with certain markers. So those are also called what's called toxicity markers. But since they won't, you know, these are mild uh, and won't cause massive organ failure, 
you can say, okay, this uh, group of people have variants X, Y, and Z, and maybe we should not give this drug A to this group because they are reacting with a fever or they're feeling nauseous or they're getting headache and so on. So those are called toxicity markers. Uh, and then there are efficacy markers. So, so those don't need to be done in vitro. It can be done in people. And you can learn a lot about toxicity markers and efficacy markers from these clinical trials. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad it was helpful. No, Zeba, that's a very good question. Um, so the question is, are there markers for how bad diabetes will become? So because there are some diabetes people have that, you know, they live with it and it's always a mild form, but then there are markers that can almost predict that it, it's going to take a bad trajectory. That is in the area of complex diseases, genetic diseases, and, and that is an area that still, I would say, relatively immature compared to monogenic diseases. So right now that I would say there are no good markers for uh, prognostics of diabetes, but hopefully it'll come because this area is maturing very rapidly of all this um, complex diseases like diabetes and so on. And so maybe 20 years from now, we would be giving patients, like not only will you get diabetes at, you know, when they're healthy at 20, but we can also say that you also have a, a, a possibility that you'll get a very bad type of diabetes that will lead to, so you need to be stringently monitoring your disease, but we are not there yet. So this is a very good question, and that is why I'm doing this study with my colleagues in Bangladesh, with Dr. Asmeri, Dr. Richard Mello, and Dr. Sabrina Elias. We want to know what could we do with publication and making awareness why the Bangladeshis don't suggest it. But what we are finding, and the study is no, by no means completed, is that they are very interested. They would love to learn. They know about it, but they are not getting resources and the labs over there don't do it. So it's not that they don't want to, but they are not exposed to it. So it's a lack of opportunity. And so I think that if there were opportunities, if there were good labs and if they were made aware by having, you know, talks like this or in a doctor's forum, that's where they learn mostly about precision medicine and a new test for a new disease a new test for an existing disease that's how we are learning that that's how they get their knowledge so it's i think that we are getting very positive feedback and and their enthusiasm for this but they're all suggesting we don't have the resources we don't have the facilities and so on and much of it is being sent to india and other countries in singapore and bangkok because um we simply don't have it in Bangladesh and doctors who are aware that other countries um, offer those tests are sending out the samples. But that is almost leading to us not knowing more about our patients and not being able to build our own databases because we are now sending out this very valuable information to other countries. And, they, and that's great. You know, they are learning about this ethnic, ethnicity, but we are not increasing our sort of workforce or helping our doctors and not understanding more about our predisposition to diseases and so on, and not building the database. Because you know, as you sequence patients, you're also building the database. More and more patients are getting into the system. Okay, the next question was, what are some implications of the integration of genomics in healthcare. Well, you know, it, it integration of genomics is not easy, as we are seeing in the developing world, because first of all, you need to have the data scientists and the bioinformaticians to know how to analyze the large volumes of data, because 
unlike uh, the clear labs, right, that are um, un giving out data to patient or, or the doctors, these have in historically done very simple tests like a blood sugar test, right? Or they look for a certain antibody or they're looking whether you have a marker for uh, a genetic marker or not, a single genotyping or a PCR like COVID. You know, it's a simple PCR test. You're looking for the COVID RNA presence or not. So those are simple tests. Those are positive or negative. Now, when you're talking about Although I'm, I'm talking about whole genome, when we don't need to do whole genome for clinics, if you're talking about 6 billion bases, that's a large volume of data if you were to sequence a patient. How do you manage that? So those are the difficulties that I was very involved with and I'm still involved in, in helping um, learning how to deal with this large size and what, what are the right sort of standards for doing a test like that so that those are very complicated things but then so many companies have sprung up over here that are doing the analysis for companies who cannot do it for the labs that can sequence but cannot analyze there are you send it through the web and you can have other companies sort of manage and uh, do the data analysis and others who do the interpretation because that takes a different skill set so um, there are, once there is a problem, there are opportunities that come in to solve that issue. Um, so those have been some issues, but there are also ethical issues, like making sure that the privacy is strictly controlled and making sure that before you sequence the DNA of a patient, you might find out incidental findings about the patient came in, let's say for, to understand if he has polycystic kidney disease marker and you sequence and you find, oh my God, this person has the Huntington's disease. So those, do I tell him or do I not tell him? Um, and does the person want to know or would he not know that I have this horrible disease that has no cure? So those are ethical and then there are legal and there are social implications of integration of healthcare and so people need to be well aware of how to deal with these issues. And it's not that means that if we don't do it, we are just, oh, um, we just position ourself, ourselves well to deal with this information and these complications in the future. Will genome sequencing become more accessible? People will uh, with genome sequencing becoming more accessible, people will be more likely to sequence a genome at an early age. Do you think this will be a driving force of CRISPR gene editing becoming more accepting? Yeah, I mean, I think CRISPR is a nice technology that is leading to gene therapy. Um, still, the delivery of CRISPR uh, and gene therapy is difficult, but if you were able to you know, deliver the CRISPR um, uh, mechanism to edit out, it would become uh, a way to fix a problem before it arises. So let's say you have a child and the child has, I'm going to use um, polycystic kidney disease that happens in adults, like when you're 40, but you know that the child has this autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease mutation. And by that time, if the CRISPR technology is, uh, I think it's, it, so we'll have to, um, you know, sort of deliver it to this baby at a, that we know that this CRISPR will not cause any other issues and it'll go directly into the autosomal dominant disease and fix it. That, but that's very much in the future. That is, I'm talking about maybe 30, 40, 50 years from now, but the more sequencing would be needed to understand what are the different uh, diseases and what are the different mutations, because, uh, and then as the gene therapy side, which is completely different, CRISPR technology becomes better and better, would, be, would we be able to then correct genetic defects before they happen? 
But that's definitely very futuristic. Even CRISPR is not being used in the clinics. It's still in the research stage, but I'm sure where delivery is easy, like in the respiratory, like for lungs, you would be able to deliver the CRISPR technology by inhalation. But for some an organ like a liver or kidney with a gene you want to alter, it'll be um, kind of, you have to figure out a way by which you can deliver the CRISPR gene therapy technology there. So I hope that was helpful. Will the use of precision medicine reduce the cost or rather increase investments in health and medicine sectors? Well, you know, precision medicine, um, again, when I talk about precision medicine area, it's not about a particular medicine, right? It's more the, the sort of the, how people practice, how doctors practice medicine and not treating everyone with the same treatment when they diseases can be subcategorized. And so that's obviously better because you will not get as good an outcome for the patient if you use it in a brute force manner, right? So if you knew a person's cancer was due to BRCA1 or versus the estrogen receptor mutation, you would give different drugs and not give both patients chemo, which can cause more harm. So in this way, you can reduce the cost because you are now dealing with patients and treating them according to their genetic mutations and their problem rather than a brute force method, which may lead to increased investment because now the patient has liver toxicity for chemo and the patient now has to be seven days in the hospital being treated for the, so it can lead to more, more and more incremental um, healthcare cost if you don't use precision medicine. But I think precision medicine, once it gets implemented nicely, it'll actually reduce cost in the long term. But people have to do that kind of, and, and data is being um, accumulated to look at the cost benefits of precision medicine ways of looking at patient. I hope that helped. Oh, thank you so much. How cute. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I hope this was helpful. And keep up the good work. You guys are doing good things for Bangladesh. Um, do pharmaceutical industries need to set additional department for the discovery and development of precision medicine? Um, yes, in fact, they don't need to set up a, additional departments, but they are bringing in the talents. Like when they do the clinical trials, they are uh, bringing in people who understand biomarkers, understand genetic markers, and be able to guide the clinical trials to do the right kind of experiments and assays on the patient sample. So definitely. I mean, I mean, you can also say that, that some of these, like Novartis and Pfizer, they have biomarker divisions that help the clinical trials. So definitely they need to bring in that talent to help guide their clinical trials, because now the clinical trials are using genetic markers and other biomarkers in the clinical trial and not doing it in the old fashioned way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad this was helpful. I really hope that you learned something about the importance of, you know, genomics in healthcare. Um, so how Biobank will play the role of preventing genetic disorders in the near future? Well, if we had Biobank, it doesn't have to be a separate biobank. It could be all the clinical labs as they do testing, they kind of deposit their sequences with the patient's consent and in a de-identified way, meaning someone's sequence comes in, you don't know what the name of the person is, where they live or anything. You just know that this is a male 
and this is a Bangladeshi, and this guy is about 40 years old, and he has, let's say, cancer and his sequence. But we don't know anything, any identifiers are wiped out. So that's called a de-identified wing. And so now if you collect, let's say, a million Bangladeshis in this biobank, in a de-identified way, where you wipe out all of the personal identifiers to that, but you keep all the phenotype, meaning you know that they have cancer, what type of cancer, when did they get it, and so on. Then you can do a lot of good research, population research, to say, okay, what do we do in managing this patient? Not just cancer. Cancer is somewhat not preventable, but managed can be managed. But if you know hypertension, and if you know about more about what are the genes and what are the genetic variants that cause hypertension, as I, you know, Zabers, Dr. Zabers' question was that, do we know enough about diabetes and hypertension? And then, then we could give them some preventive measures. Like you need to really watch out for this kind of diet. And this is what you need to do with your lifestyle. So essentially, we can know a lot more about preventing. But we need to, before prevention, we need to gather the knowledge. And the biobanks will be able to enable us to gather that knowledge. And right now, we don't have the knowledge, right, to know what might be our ethnic groups predisposition to diseases. So that's how biobanks will play a role, is that if you can do it in an ethical manner with complete de-identification of the genomic sequence and the phenotypic data, but no identifiers to say, who is Mr. Kasem, let's say. Nothing of that sort. If it's completely different, uh, and you have what's called aggregate data, then you will all you know is a 40-year-old man who had, you know, hypertension at this age and this is what his you know trajectory is and you have the sequence so that is the kind of population health research you could do with a biobank okay if genomic testing does not identify any mutations for which there are available targeted Therapies, is there any value in evaluating drugs that target other genes on that pathway? So let's say that you do a testing of a patient's, uh, you know, let's say pancreatic cancer, right? And you do not find any mutation for which there are targeted therapies. Like there are no FDA approved therapies for that patient because there's no match, right? You could put them on chemo, right? And chemo is not targeted. Chemo will kill any dividing cells. So that's why chemo causes, you know, hair to come off because it's the hair cells are, are growing cells, right? The follicles. And then you have um, a lot of, um, you know, nausea and so on because your gut cells are also growing. And so those are good cells, but they are prevented by chemo. And so there are... It's not that if there is no match, you don't know what to do. You could always take, you know, these brute force measures because there's nothing else you can do that you can uh, use chemo or other drugs that have worked for other patients without knowing the particular match of a mutation. So there, there's definitely value, but there are so many FDA-approved targeted therapies now that very likely there'll be a match, but then, you know, genomics is like cancer is very difficult and there are new mutations we are discovering every day and they may not be a targeted therapy, but at least we would have tried. So there's definitely value. If your question is, is there a value? Yes, definitely value. What are the chances of a certain side effect only appearing in a person once it's administered to them that didn't show up in trials since it's specifically engineered for that person. Um, well, you know, in a clinical trial, you're talking about, you know, thousands, phase three is thousands of people are being given the drug. And um, if 
they didn't have any side effects, then um, you could likely say that that's, for the general population, it's safe. But for that particular person who had that side effect, let's say they have tremendous nausea and we don't know why, it could be that they have a rare genetic variant that the other groups that were studied, even those thousands didn't have. And so you have to, in that case, deal with this patient by patient approach and that you will stop that side effect. And you, you can always have death, you know, that happens in any drugs. But I think precision medicine really helps reduce the terrible side effects like death and stroke and so on. But that can always happen because maybe it was a rare uh, mutation that this person had that reacted badly to that, um, you know, the, to that subtype of drug. So that's always possible. It's not unavoidable. What should be the standard IFC we should set for studying healthy and disease conditions? What, I don't understand what IFC means, so I can't help you over there. Um, and so can you explain to me what that means? Are you talking about a bioinformatic? some sort of window. It's not commonly used in clinic, clinical, you know, lingo over here. What are the main reasons you think that Bangladesh cannot use genetic technology broadly for diagnosis? Um, I think that Bangladesh, I uh, would say, certainly can use, but I think that there are very limited, that's what we are hearing from the doctors, and that's what has been my experience in talking with my you know, colleagues in the genetics world or in the clinical world, that we have very few labs that have the expertise to do the right kind of um, you know, testing and so on. So it's not that it's non-existent, it's existent you know, in some labs, but they're doing more simple genetic tests like a PCR or a genotyping, but they're very few are able to do a gene panel test or an exome test. And even if they do it, they're sending it abroad for the analysis. So I think the main reason that this technology is not expanding broadly in Bangladesh and other developing nations is that we don't have the workforce. If we had more bioinformaticians, if there were programs that universities, both private and public, were training uh, students and getting out with a master's or even an undergraduate with a major concentration in bioinformatics, and then you would see that there is a workforce out there and the labs are then being able to buy the machines and do the data analysis themselves and understand even how to, even if they buy a package software from a company that needs tweaking, we, I don't think we do have that kind of expertise there. So one of the main reasons, and this is a very good point, a very good question, is that I think that because it's a high volume uh, genomic uh, test, that d data analysis capability, and then obviously later on would be interpretation. If you get a pathogenic mutation, how do you make sure that you are able to understand that by comparing it to different databases? That's the interpretation part. So those are tech expertise that's, I think, lacking in developing nations. But it will, I think it will get better, but I think that if we leave it to chance, it won't. It has to be an active, dedicated sort of concerted effort by the government, by the private and the public um, to encourage the building of these labs, the building of these technologies in the country. It just won't happen automatically. Then you'll sort of get dependent in, 
completely sending out these tests to other countries and not being able to, you know, because if you don't build your own capabilities, then you will surely lose it. So I think the main reasons are the data. It's not the price of the test. It's not the price of the machine. It's the data analysis and interpretation expertise of the health workers in the medical technologies and data scientists. They need to be almost at the level of a PhD or master's in being able to use this software and do that kind of data analysis. Um, in case of trisomy, so that's um, trisomy of chromosome 21, because you can have trisomy of chromosome 18 and 13. Those are very deadly diseases also. Um, Trisomy is Down syndrome, like as it's called. Uh, um, so your question is, in case of trisomy, how can Bangladesh help uh, Down syndrome patient? I think that, you know, there are many Down syndrome patients over here in the United States. And um, they, you know, it's it's a spectrum. Some, some of the patients do quite well. They live, you know, almost up to 60 or you know, in rare cases, 70, they do have health complications. And so I think that Bangladesh could learn about how to take care of these patients because, because many of them are high functioning. You know, they can um, be sort of self-sufficient to a certain degree. And also I think that they should be, you know, healthcare homes to help the patient's parents um, where it becomes unmanageable, let's say for aging parents to take care of the trice, you know, Down syndrome patient as they're getting into adulthood, that they can live in a home that takes care of them and gives them that sort of dedicated care. So I think it's more a management of the disease and the different, um, in a complications that arise rather than preventing it, obviously, you know, unless you do prenatal sort of, um, you know, strategies. But once you have a Down syndrome child, it's really understanding the disease trajectory and how you can manage the child with that uh, syndrome as they get into adulthood. And, you know, some of them, you know, a friend of roommate of mine had has a Down syndrome sister, and she recently died at at a very late age, about fifty five to fifty seven, and um, she was she was fine all along. So it's just in knowing how to manage them. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. I'm happy that I've been able to help you guys. Yes, I would love to in the future. <laughs> Good, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, I think we're at the end of the session, ma'am. Uh, I would like to say thank you so much for uh, staying beyond your uh, estimated time to answer all their queries. And I would also like to thank the audience who stayed with us till the very end and also for their valuable questions. I hope we could answer them all. And with this, I thank would like so to- Thank you so much. Good session. night, everybody. So it's much. late at night. So <laughs> thank you for sticking with me. All right, thanks. Bye-bye then. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. How do I go? Stop sharing.